welcome to GD Garner Studios. Most of you know me as the international journaler and artist, but very few people get a chance to take a look around the studio and see what we do inside this beast. So we're going to give you a little tour today and show you what GD Garner Studios is all about. So people always ask me to, um, to explain my art, and um, I do very little of that. I uh, put my energy and attention usually into drawing the art and writing in the background, but uh, when I do a show, I'm always asked, you know, what does this piece mean, what does that piece mean? And sometimes it's just whimsical. Sometimes it's part of the, the little hidden code that I, I put in all of my stuff to keep it fun for people. And sometimes it has a little deeper meaning. And this one, as an example, is a piece um, that I did when I found out my dad uh, had been diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. And I remember asking, uh, God, can you help me? You know, can you help me here? Need a little help. Can you get a little help? And um, I drew this piece when I realized um, he wasn't really home that day. He wasn't taking requests. And it was just kind of one of those things where you look up to the universe and you ask, is there something more out there? And you can see that this says, you know, do you know me? And it was really kind of um, the ideology that the hand of God comes down and it's this almighty powerful thing and he holds your life and your future in his hand. And sometimes he can help you, sometimes he can't. Sometimes the cord gets cut. You know, there's a lot of symbology, but... Just different little things, and the next piece over here, any one of these others, could just be me sitting around drinking beer in a pub one day, having a good time, and letting the imagination flow. So they don't always mean something. They're just, uh, they mean something to me, but they're, you know, it's a little, little, little of everything. Again, this is a piece that um, has kind of a different meaning to me. I was living in Managua, Nicaragua, and I found these three little cards just laying in an alley somewhere. And I picked them up and carried them in my back pocket or in my backpack, as I always do. And one day, um, I took them out and got ready to put them in, and I realized that there were three letters there, D-I-D. -D. And I thought, how symbolic is that of what I believe is the way you should live your life? Go out, do what you love, conquer your fears, live your dreams, and tell people what you did, not what you hope to do. This piece here just um, kind of symbolizes all the layers that have become me. I used to be a, a corporate executive. I've lived as a homeless man. I've lived as a traveling vagabond. I've got all this, the different layers that make me who I am. And as you can see, it's got a switch hidden up here. This is a little brass leaf, but it lights up the eyes of the madman over here. So, you know, as the book is called, Through the Eyes of Madness, it's because this guy, you know, he's, he's got a little madness in him. So we just finished filming a television show called The American Journal. And it's about my life as an artist here in L.A. And um, basically the premise of the show is that each week I meet a person that's a fan or is interested in my work in some way. And I help them transform some part of their life. And we capture that in a piece of art. So this is a young girl named Allie that I met in San Diego. She was a huge fan of the artwork. And she wanted to do a photo shoot. So um, we met at this place called Medusa, which is where she works. And one of the, the rules of engagement is I always like to shoot people in their natural habitat. So I like to go see what they do and incorporate that into the work. So she was a bartender. So you can see we've got all these little bar caps, bottle tops around here, which kind of symbolize that. She loved keys and butterflies. So that was part of the um, costume that we built for her. And I built her an entire skirt of nails. So the nails that you see here are actually from the skirt for one of the costume pieces I built for the photo shoot. And then we just shot her and let her, uh, let her guard down and let her freak flag fly a little bit. And um, we auction these pieces off here at the gallery at the end of the month, and the person that we do the shoot with gets the choice to either keep the money or keep the piece of artwork. And all these weird little gears and actuators and things are just some of the fun stuff, the mechanicals that we build into all the pieces that we do. So one of the other things we do is we do a lot of interesting costuming pieces. And you can see in this piece, um, we made this piece for Kimberly Wyatt of the Pussycat Dolls. Um, she's got a hit show in the UK. Um, she's an amazing solo artist, an amazing dancer. What we did with this particular piece is we started out with a regular trench coat construction. So when her arms are down, it looks like just a regular trench coat. But when she raises her arms, you can see that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hand cut feathers. We hand dyed and hand stamped every feather in the costume. We hand uh, set probably 2,000 copper studs. We built this huge uh, bird mask that goes with it with like illuminated LED lights and the eyeballs and just made something kind of spectacular. A pair of mechanical underwear we built for another uh, video shoot that we did here. Um, we uh, directed a um, music video and shot it here for um, a universal uh, artist and um, just did some cool stuff there. We hand painted her entire body with um, latex paint and then I hand inked 100% of her body and we did a really cool kind of artistic video shoot. Um, another little costume piece. This is one of my faves actually. I, I wear this one myself. Um, but it's a little heart that we did and it's got like 52 hand painted pieces in it and we wired it all up with little LED lights and just a fun little costume piece. So we like to, uh, we like to have fun with all things artistic. 
So by now, I think everybody in the world knows that uh, Cedric the Entertainer and I have a hat company together called uh, Who Said Hats. Um, behind me, you can see a lot of the different hats that we've done. We've literally done hats for everyone from Justin Timberlake to Jimmy Kimmel. Cedric gave it to him live on air. We did one like this uh, that we uh, had Tom Hanks wear on the red carpet. We've done one for Sam Jackson, Leonardo DiCaprio, Jamie Foxx. The list goes on and on and on and on. We did one a uh, custom hat box for George Lopez. I custom matched it to the interior of his golf cart. So we're always doing these crazy high-end hats, and people are pretty aware of that tar part of the business. But what they often ask about is the Egg and Butter Club. And what is the Egg and Butter Club all about? So we created this thing. It's kind of a throwback to the 30s era, Prohibition style um, guys that were behind the scenes kind of running things. The, the guys that were called the Butter and Egg Man is what they called them. We kind of recoined it to call it the Egg and Butter Man. Were the guys that had the bankrolls. They made the decisions. No one spoke their names, but they were the, the bosses, the guys running things. You can see there's a different color lining and a different color sidewall on these. And all of those things have significance. In our egg and butter line, if you go into certain clubs in L.A. or maybe a certain club in New York that's exclusive that you can't get into, that there's a huge waiting list for, that it's VIP only or private access only, you take your hat off and you show the doorman that you're an egg and butter man, you get exclusive access. And we do a lot of fun little things like that just to let people know who's really running things. And it's the egg and butter man. So behind me, you see my clothing line, Madnamore. And again, it's just a representation of all my travels and art from around the world. Every piece has a different um, continent or a different story that's told. The writing from my journal is actually exhibited on each piece. You always uh, see the name Madnamore on the back. Um, and we've just been having some fun with it. We're doing cool little um, celebrity gift boxes. This box, I can't tell you who because I didn't give it to her. Um, but this was I actually made for somebody very, very famous. And when it was all done, I said, you know what? This is too cool. I'm keeping it for myself. And I gave her a crappier one, so that'll be our little secret. Um, but inside each one of these, you get a little thing that tells you about the history of the brand and all these custom shirts. So every single one of these is unique. There are no two pieces that I do that are the same. Um, it's really kind of a high-end vibe, and we just do it for really exclusive uh, clientele. So fun little things called Mad No More. See all about it. Go to GaryGDGarner.com. You get all the poop and all the things that we do, and this is one of them under the, under the brand page. All right, I'm going to show you guys something I've never shown on camera before. I'm going to let my secret out. And I'm going to tell you how it is that I started out uh, doing art. Um, it was a time in my life many, 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 many years ago, and I had previously had quite a bit of success in all the trappings of the modern world. And something happened in my life that led me to being pretty well broke. And I remember sitting in a casino one day, and I went with the girl that I was seeing at the time, and we had just enough money to buy lunch. And we had like an extra dollar or two left over, and we bought a keno ticket. And with that keynote ticket, we hit an $800 jackpot. And I remember sitting there through the rest of the lunch, talking it out with one another, saying, you know what, we could pay a lot of bills with this. This would really get us out of trouble. It would be great. And then deciding, you know what, we worked so hard. This is found money. Why don't we both go get something that we would enjoy that would kind of help lift our spirits and not be responsible with this money? So I believe she went out and got a kayak, and I took my half of the money, and I bought a, a set of paintbrushes and pencils and pens. And I decided that I was going to become an artist. Little did I know that I sucked at being an artist. So um, my very first piece of artwork is right here. It's an absolute atrocity, but it's the only thing I was good enough to draw. And it's the outline of a pepper. And underneath it, it says, if you're going to be a pepper, be a habanero. And you can see that as this thing progresses, the, the, the artwork does not get much better. It's all pretty rough. And so people see this. I had somebody see it here in the studio the other day, and they're like, oh, my God, that's so cute. How old were you when you did this? I'm like, uh, 34, because <laughs> they all assume it was a child's journal. But, um, you know, that led me to, to the artwork that you see behind us and, and the stuff that we do today. And um, I guess the way that it really started, uh, the L.A. studio anyway, is me publishing my book, Through the Eyes of Madness. And it's really an account of my travels around the world, um, stories about the places that I've been. And, of course, it has um, all of my artwork and photography built in thousands of photos from all seven continents. And this book actually covers um, the first five continents. The second book, which I just started working on, covers Antarctica, South America, and my four years living inside the Hollywood machine. So Through the Eyes of Madness, um, the book, and the ridiculous uh, sketches is how it all started. So people are always asking me, what are the most amazing things that you saw while, tra while, while traveling? And where were your favorite places? And time and time again, it always comes down to the same thing, which is the interesting and colorful people that I meet that make a place memorable to me, not necessarily the surroundings or the experience. 
Um, but there's one amazing place that brought all of those things together. New sights, sounds, smells, and sensations, plus really interesting people. And in my book, I talk about um, a friend of mine. I call him Preet in the book. And uh, one of the most amazing dudes I've ever met in my entire life. His father was a Bushman, like the guys in the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy. And his mother was a Maasai tribesman. So the Maasai don't really have many possessions. They've got the sashes that they wear and the dung hut that they live in. They don't really have a form of currency. They trade and they barter. And, um, very primitive life. But the Bushmen are ten times more primitive because they don't even have a dung hut. They just like live outside under trees. Well, Preet left the village way of life when he was a young man and went and got a collegiate level education. And now he's just an encyclopedia of all things anthropological and biological and just botanical and just an amazingly intelligent guy. And I remember after traveling with him uh, for uh, you know a week or so in Africa, I'm like, you know what, Pre, I would just kill to get a shower. Is there a place we can go and get like properly clean? Like, what, what are we going to do? And he said, you know, I remember this place where we can go and... Um, there's a big like water reservoir built outside, and there's a like hose coming down that the locals have built. You can go out there, you can clean up in that thing, you can get a little, you can get cleaned up. So I was quite excited about the idea. And uh, when we got to the place, we were like setting our sleeping bags out, and um, he said, "You know, what? we're going to take our jeep, we're going to park it like you know half a mile from here because we don't want the lions to smell the food inside the jeep." And I'm like, "Okay, that's a great idea." Well, in the meanwhile, we see this Maasai guy walking around. He's a young warrior guy, and he's got the spear with him, and. Um, Preet says, you know what, let's go get this guy, and we're going to hire him to patrol um, uh, our sleeping area at nighttime. And I said, okay, well, why are we going to do that? He said, well, because there are lions everywhere, and, um, you know, this guy will keep us from getting eaten by lions. And I'm like, okay, great, let's get two of those guys. Great idea, Preet. So we go over, we get this fella, and I said, so what will happen if the lions try to attack us? He'll kill them with a spear? And he says, no, 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 even the young lions that are born today recognize Maasai as predators by scent. He said, so just by having him out there, they will smell him, and he will smell like a predator, and the lions will stay away. He said, you, my friend, on the other hand, smell like a snack. So it would probably be good to have this guy around. And I'm like, okay, thanks. Very, very helpful. So I said, look, let's just get this down. In case I were to get attacked by a lion, what exactly do I do? Do you play dead? Do you run? Do you go up a tree? Do you jump over the water? What do you do? What's the move, Pree? He said, well, I'll tell you what, Gary, if you're attacked by a lion, here's what you do. He said, I want you to get down like this on your haunches. I want you to raise your hands above your head like this and show all of your teeth and make the biggest sound you can. Rawr! And I'm like, well, what will that do? Will it scare the lion off? He said, no, if a lion decides to attack you, you're going to die, but you will die with bravery in your heart. I said, oh, fantastic, pre brilliant, brilliant suggestion. So he was quite the character. He was quite the joker. So I get up one morning. It's early. No one's up yet. And I... Preet's still sleeping, and I see a little fire burning, and I go over to the fire, and I make myself a cup of coffee, and I'm just sitting out there just taking in nature and thinking about how amazing it is. And I look maybe 100 yards or so away, and I see the guy that we hired to patrol our, our, our camp area with a spear. And he's got something in his eye, and he sees it. And he pulls the spear up, and he's starting to hunt this thing. And I'm like, ooh, could be a lion. Could be what we're having for breakfast. I don't really know, but it's quite interesting. But my view was obscured by our Jeep. So I couldn't quite see what was on the other side of the thing that he was hunting. And I had my camera sitting on my lap, but I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to spook it. I didn't want to distract him. Maybe he would get eaten by the lion. I don't really know how this all works. So I'm going over there nice and slowly. And I'm like trying to sneak around the side of the Jeep. I'm holding real still. And he gets up just to the other side of the Jeep. He's going up behind one bush. He's up behind the next bush. He gets down there. He gets ready for the coup d'etat. He's got his spear up. He's getting ready to just throw this spear through whatever this thing is. I step around to take the picture. He sees me. He looks down at his prey, and he just drops his head in shame. And he's just like, and I thought, what in the world is going on? And I look at the side of the Jeep, and on the side of the Jeep, there's an image of another tribesman painted on a Jeep, holding a spear and holding a shield. And from a distance, he had never seen like a 2D image before of a, of a tribesman. He thought it was a real person coming to attack him, and the colors on the shield were from a tribe that was not a friendly tribe. And when he sees it, he realizes... This thing isn't real, and this stupid white guy over here just saw me hunt the side of this Jeep, and I'm just so embarrassed. So being the guy that I am, I'm like, i got to go talk to this guy, because he's interesting. We're going to have ourselves a nice conversation. Now, mind you, I don't speak any Maasai whatsoever. i got a little bit of Swahili, and I can charade in just about any language. After living in, like, seven continents and dozens and dozens of countries around the world, I can act out whatever I need. Problem is that a third of the Maasai language comes in sign. So I'm always getting myself in trouble in countries where sign is part of the language because I'm 
charading something that doesn't always translate. But I see this guy, and I want to ask him about the rites of passage ceremony. So I go over to him. It's a big, tall guy, strong guy, got this spear. And I'm charading out and asking, okay, man, how does this thing work? Like when you hunt lions as a small child. And he tells me, and he acts it all out, and he shows me that basically what they do is they have two young Maasai boys. One will go on each side of the lion, so the lion is forced to choose a direction. And then they get down, they hold the spear up, and they'll go down on one knee, and when the lion goes to attack and drag down its prey, they hold the spear, the, 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 the shield up to, to shield, and then they stab him underneath the spear, or underneath the shield. So I think I got this all, and I want to be sure. So I repeat it back to him. I say, okay, so like two of you dudes, you do this, you go around, and the guy gets all irritated with me. And he goes through the whole charade again. I'm like, okay, dude, I got this. I heard you the first time. There's two of you. One go, all right. And every time I get to that part of the story, he just gets more and more frustrated with me. So I'm like, hmm, this doesn't seem to be going too well. And he's getting more and more agitated. So about this time, I see Preet coming up from, from, um, from the area that we're sleeping in. And he says, um, Gary, why are you upsetting the man with a spear? I can't leave you alone for five seconds. You're always getting into some kind of trouble. Like, why you got this man so worked out? And I said, dude, I'm just trying to have a conversation with him. I don't know what his problem is. So Preet starts asking him in his uh, mother tongue, what's going on here? And the guy says, listen, I've told this dude 10 times that I hunt lions, and, you know, he just isn't smart. He's not getting it, and he's insulting me. And, and Preet said, did you insult him? I said, shit, I don't know. I don't even speak the language. So he said, well, what did you say? And I said, well, I was repeating it back to him, and I said, uh, whatever the hand gesture was. And the hand gesture that I kept doing meant that he would run away in fear. So he kept telling me, I kill lions. And I kept saying, yeah, yeah, but you're afraid of them, and you run away. And he said, you know, he's insulted by that. And, I, and he says, you know, Preet, tell your friend here, um, or, or he says, Preet, between you and I, I don't think your friend here is too smart. I've told him like 10 times to hunt lions, and he keeps insisting that I'm afraid. And I said, hey, tell him I'm not the one that snuck up on the side of the Jeep this morning. So the Messiah guy laughs his head off, and he says, I tell you what, when your buddies wake up over there uh, from the, uh, the, the tent, I won't mention anything about you being too dumb to understand how the lion hunting thing works. If you see some other Maasai dudes, maybe we just keep the whole jeep hunting thing between the two of us. So that was pretty much my life on the road. I would befriend anyone who came my way, and we would relate uh, to the things that were germane to their way of life, and they would teach me about their cultural things, and I would somehow offend, and they would somehow get forgive. And uh, it was just great to be able to get out there and spend time with people who are happy and content in the things that they have in life, even though it's not the brightest and shiniest ball, and it's not the nicest thing that the neighbor has. It's the things that helped their families succeed and survive. And it taught me a lot about life and what was really important. And it really taught me that friends and companions can come in any size, shape, form. And uh, you should take the time to get to know the person sitting next to you because there's a chance to really change your life. So amazing, amazing time. And Africa was just one tiny little stop. But, uh, you know, a million stories just like that one where every day I felt like an eight-year-old child because I experienced something so new and so foreign to my way of life. Well, guys, thanks for joining us at uh, Creative Current on LA Artstream. Um, I appreciate you taking a look at what we do. Um, appreciate you touring the studio. Come back anytime. And uh, you can check out all the things we do at GaryGDGarner.com. And uh, have some fun. Be creative. Celebrate the works of my man, G.D. Gardner, Vagabond Virtues. 200 of the most amazing pieces of work are being unveiled tonight for the first time. Yeah, I hear it's the art's like fierce, like off the, off the chain, so I'm excited. And just walking around, I see a lot that goes on inside of his head, you know what I'm saying? So that blew my mind. Amber Valdez here, and I've interviewed some of the biggest A-list celebs in the business, from Hugh Jackman to Adam Sandler. But today, I couldn't be more thrilled to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Gary Gardner. My favorite part was the interactive pieces. I liked how you could turn the knobs and push the buttons and you could see how it worked. Toxic language in the space of meaning.
you're an artist, you're a philanthropist, you started your own clothing line, you're an author, you're a world traveler. Slow drifts of meaning. He's one of these people that, uh, you know, lives life, you know, right on the edge and he goes for it. He sees it, sees things that he wants to do. Nothing kind of holds him back. He's amazing. Uh, Gary has a lot of great paintings. Gary, the best artist in the world. Gary, right here, Gary. Mr. Gardner. The photos he took were incredible. People notice his journals. What brings you out here tonight to Vagabond Virtues? I am so excited to see Gary's art. So I'm thrilled to be here and to feature his art. Gary has a lot going on all the time. He is constantly juggling 10 different balls of all these different businesses. We've currently been working on specifically designed pieces for Justin Timberlake. We've designed a costume for Kimberly Wyatt from the Pussycat Dolls. He has a hat line with Cedric the Entertainer. And we just got commissioned to do some custom pieces for Dr. Dre's tour. And with all of that going on, he's also doing these custom artworks that he's auctioning off. I've been a fan of uh, GD Garner's for many, many, many years now. Gary G.B. Gardner is a different kind of dude. I was blown away when I saw the final piece. I love it when art becomes an opportunity for people to escape from their regular lives. Gary Garner is an artistic madman, and he's one of my biggest inspirations. And Paris over the shoulder. He's the man, GD Garner. What else can I say?